So now we're going to go to the next rule for psi. It's a very standard rule. If alpha is a limit ordinal and there's a fundamental sequence for alpha, then I'd like to create psi of alpha, but really what I want to create is the fundamental sequence for psi of alpha. And what you do is you just take the, to get the nth term of the fundamental sequence for psi of alpha, you just take the fundamental sequence, nth term of the fundamental sequence for alpha and apply psi to it. And so pr presumably we're interested in psi of alpha because we know what psi is for all the ordinals before it, and these are going to be less, and then this will give, me a, give us an answer we can understand. So one thing that's weird, though, is I've never had to say this uh, if there's a fundamental sequence for alpha before. And I don't mean just uh, have we determined it or have we specified it. That, that there's always this issue that there's choices involved in that, and I usually suppress the dependence on that choice. Um, but really what I mean is if there is a fundamental sequence for alpha at all, and we're going to get into territory where that's not going to be true for every limit ordinal alpha, um, and in fact, for some of the ones that we really, really, really are interested in. Um, so this, that, that proviso will become crucial very soon, but for a while, it's not going to be an issue. Uh, we're just going to do this. So limit ordinals are going to be really quite straightforward for a while. Okay, so simplest example to do, for example, after do, doing psi of all the finite ordinals, is just to do psi of omega. So that brackets n is just psi of omega brackets n, which is just psi of n. Very standard uh, compared to all lots of examples um, that we've done. So g of that, for example, we want to look at g of psi of omega. What kind of growth does that have as a function? Of course, you put in into that. That means you're supposed to use the nth term of the fundamental sequence for psi of omega. And then that's just really psi of n. So now we're just taking this g of psi of n and applying n to it. Okay, well, that's just putting the, doing the formula we just had that had a k in here and just putting an n in it as usual. Just the usual diagonalization. When there's an open slot, put an n in it. And so that happens to be exactly, uh, well, this approximation happens to be exactly n double up n squared. But it actually uh, often is helpful to just write it this way because that was the starting point, and this tells us how many uh, n minus 1s did we add to it. Um, so... It's a meaning, I would call it a meaningful leap from n double up n, uh, what we had with um, epsilon naught, to n double up n squared. Even though n squared is not our idea of a big, grow fast growing function, we are putting it into the more powerful slot in the double up. Okay. Um, so, uh, and in particular, it's bigger than n double up n and then double up that by n, which we've seen only gives you like a 2n minus 1 in the powerful slot. So it's a meaningful leap, not getting to n triple up 3, which we'll get to, but it's not, not getting there yet. Okay. So one of the things I've been really focusing on is um, just talking about the fundamental sequences for the psi values so far, and then immediately going to g values for those things um, to get a kind of um, down-to-earth idea of what's going on. But I haven't actually focused on what psi of 1, psi of 2, psi of omega actually are. So let me just say a little bit about that. Okay. Um, we, it's not necessarily something we actually have to focus on too much, but it, you might feel pretty lost or, you know, not sure of things if you don't actually have a description of what those ordinals are. So we know what psi of zero is, as epsilon naught, super famous ordinal. Um, psi of one is the limit of that to itself, to itself, to itself, to itself, right? The tower, just a double up tower of epsilon naughts. Okay. Um, so we'll t say a minute, in a minute, just more about that, and that, that's, we, we've seen that in uh, earlier videos, but I want to come back to it. Then psi of 2 is the limit of this tower, right, um, etc. And then, of course, psi of omega, that's the biggest one we have so far, is just, of course, the limit of psi of 0, psi of 1, psi of 2. So this is just restating the stuff about fundamental sequences, but focusing on the limit um, of the sequences and not like the nth term of the sequence. Okay, so what about Veblen? We can relate this to Veblen. I'm going to do a little bit of relating to Veblen for a while, and then I'm just going to kind of not say a lot about the comparison to Veblen, because partly because we'll go away from it, and partly because this is its own thing. You don't absolutely need to always relate it to the Veblen functions. But remember, the Veblen function started out with phi naught being really super crucial, um, the generator of the, 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 our first string of infinite ordinals, omega to the alpha. And then phi 1 of 0 was epsilon 0, which is the first fixed point of phi naught. And then phi 1 of 1 is supposed to be the first fixed point, uh, the second fixed point, rather, of phi naught. And we get that, as we know, by starting with that epsilon naught, <clears throat> otherwise known as phi 1 of 0, 
add one to get out of the fixed point trap, and then put it into the omega exponentiation machine. Or in other words, it's the limit of all this stuff written out with just exponents and epsilon naught and that kind of stuff. Okay, so I just want to point out that looks fairly similar to the limit of epsilon naught tower, uh, a tower of exponentials, but um, it seems like seems like psi of one should be bigger because epsilon naught is quite a bit bigger than than omega, and that's what's going on. What we're taking exponents of, but remember, uh, when we're talking about finite, large finite numbers. The, the, by far the thing that matters most is the, the top slot of that, and the base slots don't matter very much. Well, uh, ordinal arithmetic, as you might expect, is kind of takes that, and instead of making it an approximation, it actually makes it an equality. So let's see what happens. So this is a kind of cute tricks with ordinal exponents and fixed points. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, if you just do omega to the epsilon naught plus 1, by rules of exponents, so omega to the epsilon naught times omega to the 1, or omega, um, now, omega to the epsilon naught, remember, though, is just epsilon naught. By definition, epsilon naught is a fixed point, in fact, the initial fixed point of the omega to the x function. So it's epsilon naught times omega. Okay, so that's another way to, way to think about that. Now, what if you do omega to the omega to the epsilon naught plus 1? That's the second stage in the Veblen way of, um, approx of approximating, getting towards phi 1 of 1. Okay, so that's omega to the epsilon naught omega by the previous calculation, and um, by another famous rule of exponents, which is still true for ordinal exponentiation, that's omega the epsilon naught all to the omega. Oh, hey, omega the epsilon naught again, that's epsilon naught to the omega. Okay, so what we've seen is that a, a double tower of omega bases can be translated into um, a single uh, epsilon naught base, even though it's a much bigger ordinal in some sense. Hmm, interesting. Okay, now let's see what ha happens if you do omega to the omega to the omega to the epsilon naught plus 1. Okay, that's omega to this thing we just did. And here's a one more trick that is definitely a not obvious trick, I think, with ordinal arithmetic in this situation. You know, omega is the same as 1 plus omega. And they're absolutely the same ordinal, as we've talked about before. And so this exponent can be write, written as epsilon naught, just a sort of for free epsilon naught you can put in front, times epsilon naught to the omega. So that's, these are the same exponent, absolutely the same. And now we can use this trick, okay, omega to the epsilon naught, that part, oh, we used that trick already, that's epsilon naught, raised to the epsilon naught to the omega power, okay? So now we get something that is actually bigger than epsilon naught raised to itself. And we never used epsilon naught as an explicit base over here, and now we're getting things like epsilon naught to the epsilon naught, but actually something even bigger. So if you keep doing that, on the left-hand side over here, then the Veblen definition, phi 1 of 1, is the limit of these guys. Well, it's at least as big as the limit of a tower of epsilon naughts, because we can just keep doing this trick over and over and over again. Okay. Um, so wait, so maybe actually the Veblen is the one that's bigger, even though the psi limit, which was this guy, certainly seemed to be bigger. Well, no, they actually end up um, being equal, um, because, let's see, so if you do it the other way, another cool trick is you t if you take omega to the epsilon naught just times 2, or in other words, omega to the epsilon naught plus itself, that's omega to the epsilon naught times omega to the epsilon naught, rule of exponents. And okay, again, the fixed point gives us that's epsilon naught squared. So notice what that says is that exponentiation by omega turned doubling into squaring. Okay. And that's actually straight up, uh, that's only one of those steps is, is a weird ordinal fact. It's mainly just how exponents usually work. And now, uh, omega to the epsilon naught squared, well, that's omega to the epsilon naught times epsilon naught. Aha, that's epsilon naught to the epsilon naught on the nose. Okay. Well, so that means that if I take the limit of these guys, I can think that it's not too much of an extension of what I've just had said here. That can be thought of as like omega to the omega to the omega to the omega to epsilon naught squared, which is definitely bigger than epsilon naught plus one. So what happens is they kind of interleave with each other. And in the limit, these sequences both have exactly the same limit. Okay, so it's one of these funky things about ordinal arithmetic is that the limit of this sequence is absolutely exactly the same ordinal as the limit of this sequence. So in fact, psi of one is nothing more nor less than phi one of one. It really is just the first, the, the one Veblen function applied to one. And in fact, it turns out that psi, for a long, long time, actually just replicates phi 1 
the which is the epsilon function. It's the epsilon sub alpha function, um, based on on little tricks like this. Now, one thing is when we actually look at the fundamental sequences that we've been interested in, um, they are a little bit different because one fundamental sequence looks at a finite stage of this thing. And another fundamental sequence, the one for psi, looks at a finite stage of this. They're a little different, but this argument also shows that they're only different by like one or two um, stages, something like that. So they're they're pretty similar. Um, so yeah, so the, the punchline is that for a while, and I'll tell you when it stops being true, is that psi is just a, a, a little bit of a different way to uh, label phi one. Um, and, but using but we're using somewhat different fundamental sequences, not at all radically different. Okay, um, so that's a little comparison to Veblen that's kind of kind of nice. Um, let's uh, let's stop right there, um, and then we're going to go on to psi of omega two. And pretty, I think in the next video we'll finally see big omega coming in um, and start getting an idea of what's with the uncountable stuff, what's with the new stuff that goes beyond Veblen. Maybe the next video, maybe the one after that.